you for joining us on We've Got Issues. I'm Nancy Furness. We've Got Issues is a nonpartisan citizens-based forum where we look at topics of concern to the Tri-Cities. And we'd like to thank Tri-Cities Community Television for um, helping us to make these interviews possible. We're filming on location today at the Fountainhead Network in Port Coquitlam. And before we start, I'd like to acknowledge that the interview today is taking place on the traditional, ancestral, and unceded territories of the Coquitlam First Nations. And we thank the Coquitlam people for um, continuing to live on these lands and protecting the lands and the water and all that lies above and below. So today I'm joined by Ben Perry, who is making a run for Coquitlam City Council. So thank you so much for joining us today, Ben. Thanks, Nancy. It's good to be here. That's awesome. I'm, I'm wondering if we could start <laughs> just by learning a little bit more about you. If you could tell us a bit about your background and maybe um, why, why you're running for City Council. Yeah, thanks. Good question. Um, <clears throat> well, I started uh, getting involved in city politics with an organization called Force of Nature. Uh, and we'd been working on climate change in Tri-Cities and the Lower Mainland. So uh, I was leading the team in Tri-Cities and one of the, the big campaign I think that we did in Coquitlam was to um, bring the public support for the United Nations climate targets to the city. Um, and in 2019, the city decided to adopt those climate targets as part of their environmental sustainability plan. So um, through that process, it was a lot of work. There were a lot of things that went into it, and I got to know a bit more about the municipal process. And, uh, and while I was doing that out, we also realized we needed voices on council to support um, climate action. So um, seeing no one else wanting to do it, I volunteered. You stepped up to the challenge. Yeah. Um, thank you very much for that. And I think maybe if we could just start by talking about um, what inspired you to run for city council. Was it the state of our climate or was it something else? Like um, just why are you running for city council now? Yeah, so I think the, the issues that matter to me for the city, um, a lot of it has to go, has to do with, uh, I, have, I have two sons, uh, they're 12 and 15. And um, I think about where they're gonna live, what their life's gonna be like in the future. Um, climate change is going to be a part of that and I think every level of government, every country in the world has to address that, uh, including the city of Coquitlam. Mm -hmm. um, but there are other issues that are important for me, for my children too. They need recreation space, they play hockey, they need, um, they also need to go to the parks, swimming pools, um, and they're going to need a place to live. And right now, uh, Canada, uh, Lower Mainland and Coquitlam are facing an housing affordability crisis as well. Right. So that's another issue that's really important to me. Okay, so you've got, like us, <laughs> you have lots of issues. Um, <laughs> so I just, let's start with climate action because uh, the city of Coquitlam has just approved their first environmental sustainability plan and it lays out a, a sort of some goals and a plan, a way to get to those goals, as well as a, a way to monitor whether they are achieving those goals or not. And one of those objectives in there is to come up with a climate action plan. And I believe that's in the works now in Coquitlam. What would you like to see in that plan? Yes, I'd like to see, I'd like to see where the plan's going. Um, and I'm looking forward to the first updates on it, uh, hopefully before the election. Mm -hmm. um, but also what I'd like to see in the plan, and I, I don't know what's in there right now, uh, is based on where the emissions are coming from in the city. And we know from the Metro Vancouver reports, uh, Climate 2050, that over 50% of the emissions in Metro Vancouver come from buildings and vehicles. So we need to get policy in there that helps to start reducing that towards our goal of net zero emissions by 2050. And that's something that we can do at the municipal level, um, looking at the buildings, or are there specific actions you'd like to see? Yeah, so cities have a lot to do with buildings, but also transportation infrastructure. So for buildings, um, a lot of cities have now required high efficiency electric heating in all new buildings, and uh, 
are providing lots of ways for the city, for citizens and people who own buildings to retrofit the buildings with, mm. with those zero emission heating systems. <clears throat> but there's also um, embodied carbon. So the construction of buildings means there's emissions released um, in the production of materials, the transportation of materials, and the disposal of those materials too. At the every step of the way through the whole sort of life cycle. And I think that's something that we don't always take into consideration, right? Yes. Uh, there is a local uh, company or nonprofit even that helps, that provides a tool for helping to track it for developers that's being used um, various by various developers. Oh, well, that's interesting. Yeah. yeah. Um, I think it's called Sea Change Labs. And um, I've, I've talked briefly to them, and I think um, it's organizations like that, tools like that, that we need to start looking at. Mm -hmm. No, it sounds like um, definitely a, a good way to track what's happening there, and also maybe a way to start putting accountability in. So once we're able to track it, then we can see where, you know, hopefully we can make some changes. Yeah, you know what's interesting? Talking to Phil Northcott from Sea Change Labs, he said, these things don't make a big price difference. So it's really oh, about really? knowing what, yeah, what choices to make. And then you pick the low hanging fruit because we don't have to get to net zero right now. We have, we have, there's steps we need to take. So we can make some, make changes that don't cost a lot and make a big impact. Right, so um, that, those are some good actions there. Is there anything else that you um, anticipate or you would hope to see in the climate action plan? Are there opportunities there that the city could take? Yeah, so um, we talked about buildings. Uh, besides how buildings are built, there's also where they're built, so the, the development and also the transportation infrastructure between them. So we could talk mm -hmm. about both those things, but I think that's where we can look for the long-term uh, savings and emissions also from transportation and vehicles. <clears throat> Let's talk about um, transportation in the city and what can be done there, or what would you like to be seen done there um, as far as maybe electrical vehicles, um, transit, like what sort of options would you like to see happen? Yeah, so um, n not everybody is going to be able to go car free, but, okay. we, know, but we know that um, there's plans to get every vehicle electric within the next couple of decades. Uh, so we need to make sure the infrastructure is there for charging those vehicles. Right now, the city does not require rough-in electric charging for every parking spot, and I think that's some, that kind of thing is what we need to do. We need to also look at charging in commercial spaces and guest parking and things like that. So those are things that are under <clears throat> municipal control that mm -hmm. um, we could be, or is there other things that we could be asking of developers? Um, I, the city already does some asking of developers for, um, uh, I think there are transportation measures, I can't remember the exact term, mm -hmm. uh, where the developers can choose to add things like bike parking, um, oh, okay. uh, things like that. Uh, I think we need to look and make sure we're getting lots of that in there. And then uh, the city itself is, is starting to get into building uh, bicyc more bicycle and walking infrastructure. We see it growing around the city. Um, they've been talking about adding a separated protected bike lane. And right. I think that's a really important thing is to have that fast, safe uh, way for people to cycle around. But it's not just bikes. Uh, the city builds multi-use pathways, which can be used by bikes, but they're really best for people who are walking and using mobility aids like wheelchairs and scooters okay. and things like that. And yep. I think when you talk about separated bike lanes, that does take it to a whole new level because um, I've, been a bike commuter. I'm not now, but I was in the past for many years. And it's, <laughs> you take, you literally take your life in your hands sometimes if you're sharing the roadway. Um, so having that barrier there or the separated bike path is, would be a big incentive for a lot of people to get on their bikes. Um, yeah. In fact, not having it's a barrier. You're, br you're a brave person, Nancy. <laughs> <laughs> I've been brave. I don't know if I'm that brave now to ride down a major route and try and get somewhere fast on a bike with all the cars and trucks. It's, it's scary yeah. and cars, doors opening and cars whipping by and people coming out from driveways. You just don't know. So, but yeah. you know, do you know what I saw today in Coquitlam? Hmm. I saw a, a mother on a cargo bike and the cargo bike had like a little canopy. It was almost a rickshaw with two wheels. And there was a child in there. Like people are starting to... It's more visible. Yeah, there's yeah. people are starting to, to use their bikes. Um, well, if we have that infrastructure in mm -hmm. place, um, yeah, I think people will get out. We've got the climate that mm -hmm. we can do that for most months of the year. Yeah. Um, 
So as far as the, I just want to stick with the climate action plan a little yeah. bit longer. I have one more question. Mm -hmm. When this, uh, the environmental sustainability plan was developed, there was a lot of public input. Um, and I think people felt that they were heard at least to some degree on it. Whose voices do you think need to be at the table with respect to uh, developing the climate action plan? Like who should, who should be part of that um, input? Well, I mean, hopefully everyone in the city to start with, first of all. Mm -hmm. And um, I also, I think it's important that we reach out to people we haven't traditionally. So, um, and I, I'm not sure who that is. I don't know. I think there's, there's the people at the city are experts on sending out these surveys. Um, but I'd love to see how it intersects with other needs, people with disabilities, mm -hmm. um, low-income people, people who don't speak English very well. Yeah. I think getting input from all groups like that are really important. I think that's data that maybe we didn't even know we were missing until COVID happened. And then we saw sort of how coarse the data really was. So, um, yeah, I think there have been maybe some voices missing at the table up until now. Um, I guess the second, another priority that you talked about was affordability and housing. Can you share some thoughts on that? Yeah, so I've been trying to learn more about housing. Uh, my current understanding of housing includes um, the fact that Co Coquitlam just published, um, it was actually a, they hired someone to do a housing needs report. Right. So we have more detailed information on the housing needs in Coquitlam. Uh, it really highlights that uh, renters, 40% are in what they call core housing need, where they're spending way too much money on rental. And it's is making, that too much money? Is that like over 30% of their income? Or? Yeah, so over 30% of their income on, on rentals. Um, and it also highlighted the, how much it's affecting seniors uh, and families and uh, recent immigrants as well are all having a lot big challenges with housing. So what kind of options should be, for, like what can we do? Um, you know, I don't think there's a one size fits all, but what do you see um, as being maybe part of the solution? Yeah, well, I think I've heard that we need to build more housing and I think that can't be wrong. The, mm. the That's come from the federal and the provincial government and they've apparently they're putting money where, where that talk is too. So the next four years, there's gonna be money available to build more affordable housing. And that's coming federally and provincially? Yes, said? I think there's, uh, there's gonna be, um, that's what the people I talked to at Nonprofit Housing Association told me. I don't know all the details, but I know it's on their radar and, I, and from what I heard, there's money coming for that. Um, and I, I know Coquitlam's done a great job at building rental. Um, there's a couple things I think we need to think about. One is not losing existing affordable housing and the people that live there. Uh, so when affordable housing's redeveloped, often the people living there don't have a place to go in the city because it's too expensive for them to stay here. And these are, right. this is our community. These are people, this is the, every person who lives here is a, is a piece of our community that's important. And we lose them, we don't hear their voices and we don't get them back. They have no way of coming back. Yeah, and once they leave, it's going to be hard for us to hear their story because mm -hmm. they're somewhere else. Yeah, no, that's, uh, I, I think again, like that missing data, right? We'll never, we'll never have that information. Mm -hmm. um, so, uh, yeah, I think housing is going to be a big issue. And what are your thoughts on densification and how dense, how dense should we go? <laughs> like where and where should densification <clears throat> happen? Yeah, I know... Um, We've, the, the density that is coming to the city center of Coquitlam is, it's almost mind boggling. It blows my mind when I look at the plans for it. Um, and that comes with all kinds of concerns. We look at the, the roads, it doesn't look like we're gonna get wider or more roads. So, I mean, that's a call for, we need to be able to have um, ways for people to get around that don't involve cars. Right. Um, but also, if we want affordability, we want more, uh, and, and the, the federal, at the federal level, they're telling us we need to, and provincial, we need to build more housing than we're on track to build. That's what they say oh, in order okay. to solve, yeah. The Canadian Housing and Mortgage Corporation said that uh, two months ago. 
And the BC government said, I think they had a, a number of houses that we need to add to our current projected wow. amount of houses to produce. But I guess, yeah. um, what should that housing look like? Like, yeah. should it be all the same or should we have a variety? Like, how, how do we... I, Make sure that everybody has somewhere to live. <laughs> that's the, I mean, that's the problem. And, um, you know, Coquitlam has done, has, has tried to have a variety of housing options uh, from townhomes to low rise apartments to these very tall buildings right. and, and the stuff in between. Um, and we've done a great job with this, with the very tall stuff recently, but I think we're going to need more of that medium level kind of housing and we need mm -hmm. to figure out where to put it if we're going to reach, if we're, if we're going to fill the need, which has right. been identified. So when you say medium, are you talking like townhouses and mm -hmm. condos and shared housing? Or what do you mean by well, that? Well, I'm, I'd like to learn more about it. And I think there's a lot of numbers involved. Um, but I mean, definitely from what I've heard, having um, smaller apartment buildings, maybe further away from SkyTrain, but on a bus route, uh, oh, okay. You know, three, four, five stories. Um, build them near small shopping centers too. Like there's, I, w I went to, um, I think there's a there's a Eagle Ridge Plaza near Eagle Ridge Pool. Nearby, it's surrounded in townhouses, so it's it's hmm. it's a little bit denser than detached homes. So it's kind of its own little hub. Almost. Yes, but I think this is the this is the density solution for 20 years ago. Oh, okay. So I think that we need to look at this this kind of this kind of small hub, mm -hmm. but it, it's going to have to be many times as dense if we're going to if we do have to meet this housing need. Right. Yeah. Now, along with development, and I'm going into one of my own passions here, okay. <laughs> <laughs> along with development comes the need to, um, I don't know, find some kind of balance. We're losing so much green space. Our big trees are coming down. Um, you know, we know now during COVID and we know with climate change that those trees are important to us as a community. So can you talk about that? How do we find a balance and are those trees important? Like. Yeah. Um, well, trees are important. <laughs> I, trees are important for climate change, uh, uh, for sure, uh, whether they're in the city or in the forested lands. Um, I Just last week, I know another development was improved going further into the forest in Burke Mountain, and that's mm -hmm. a, pl a plan in Coquitlam. So over the next few decades, we're going to be losing a large number of trees in Coquitlam as we develop Brook Mountain. Um, it would be nice to keep the same amount of tree cover in so Coquitlam. So you're talking canopy coverage now. Yeah, I've heard about that and I think it's a good idea. I, I know where I live there's lots of trees and so we have birds and squirrels and there's shade yeah. and it's cool and the air's clean. Uh, all these benefits that trees provide in the city. Um, and if you can find a good place, part of the city that has nice trees and you wa you're walking underneath them, you'll, you'll notice the difference of how, mm -hmm. how much more comfortable it feels, the temperature's better, you're sheltered from the, the weather. Yeah. Yeah. So how do you, is there a way that we can maintain that canopy coverage? Like, is there something, we will be seeing trees come down, um, should we be do, taking any actions now to... <clears throat> make sure that you know we have trees in the future. I know that Coquitlam has recently I think planted a thousand trees which is um, impressive but we're seeing so many more come down right we're seeing a lot come down. Yeah I I wonder if um, like when we're planting a, a new tree they're small mm -hmm. um, they might be a species that never gets very big. Yes. Um, and there uh, there are big trees. I know the the first house I lived in in Coquitlam I believe the the large cedar tree that's in the front yard is still there uh, from when I was a child. It must be over 100 years old. Wow. And, you know, you couldn't wrap your hands, arms around the trunk. Yeah. Um, just the, the value of that is in terms of the carbon, the value to the ecosystem, mm -hmm. all that kind of stuff. Um, it can't really be replaced by a small tree. Yeah. Or even two or three small trees. I guess so, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I guess one of the things that um, Brad Nickerson, my mm -hmm. co-host and I, always yep. 
talk about in our We've Got Issues interviews is um, something that I think it applies to probably every municipality in British Columbia and beyond, and it's respectful workplace. So I think we've seen some pretty contentious issues in each of the Tri-Cities. We see people that, you know, are trying to do the right thing, but with very differing opinions and approaches. And sometimes that can lead to um, uncomfortable situations. And can you tell us a little bit about how you would handle that type of um, situation? Because it's an environment that you may find yourself in, right? Yeah. To be to be honest, like I, the workplace I work in now, when there is bullying or harassment going on, there's there are policies for dealing with it, and there's a procedure for talking to uh, someone that has a way to solve those problems. I think that we should we should find we should find a way to do that for sure, where there is a procedure where we can call it out, where we can say this is bullying. We need to stop stop this so from happening. Do you think like, uh, are you talking about a code of conduct? I think a code of conduct would be great. Um, I'm not sure if there is, but there should be someone whose job it is in the province to deal with these, address these complaints. I assume there's some kind of ombudsperson or something. Now that's really interesting yeah. that you bring that up <laughs> because there has been a lot of talk lately about, right now there's really nothing in place. Um, so there has been a lot of talk lately about doing exactly that, having some oversight at the provincial level. So when um, issues come up that they can't be resolved, then that's when this independent um, oversight can, can start. So whether it's an ethics commissioner or um, ombudsman, uh, there is that sort of separate layer there. So from what I'm hearing you say, that's something that you would support. Yeah, I would support it. Uh, yeah, wholeheartedly. I think there are, and uh, there's specific protected classes of people that are subject to sexism, racism, homophobia, transphobia, um, ableism, ageism, all the all these kind of things. Uh, and there's all kinds of issues that we can um, that we I, that I think to make our democracy more accessible, we need to address those in the places where we do democratic process. Right. And then as far as um, you bring up democratic processes, um, how would you promote um, transparency? At, when, if you were on council, um, what would you do to make sure that things were transparent and that the public was engaged and um, made aware of, of what was happening? Um, I, I don't know if I have an answer for Coquitlam. Um, I know that uh, the Coquitlam City Council meetings are, 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 the videos are available online. You can click on items in the agenda and it'll actually go to that part of the video now. Okay. Um, it'd be nice to see a record of voting. I know in Vancouver there's a councillor who's taking it upon themselves to like make a voter card for every right. now vote. That's an interesting, yeah. yeah, and then you can look at trends and look back and um, yeah, so we don't have that in Coquitlam. I think it takes a, a quite a bit of time to access how people voted um, on okay. different issues. So you have to look through the videos or the minutes and things like that. So, right, so yeah. somebody would have to be pretty dedicated to go back and, it, yeah. It'd be nice if there's a quick guide to see. Mm -hmm. yeah. So when, if you were successful on yeah. getting on um, Coquitlam City Council, what is one change that you would really like to see happen? Uh, in the city? Um, well, the climate plan is the, is the first thing I want to start looking at. Yeah. Um, I would also like to see more protection for uh, people who are in core housing need. So um, whether, and I don't know which, what that would be, but uh, a maintenance bylaw would be one issue that I think would be important for when there's an owner who has a property where there's parts of it being rented out. Uh, with their standards of maintenance they have to, to okay. meet, including mobile home parks. Um, or also to improve the um, policy for people who are have to relocate when something's redeveloped. There's, they have enhanced the policy, but I, from talking to people, I don't think it's enough. If they exercise their provincial right to, 
of refusal, I think, and they can have a place in the new building, they still have to wait while it's being constructed, and a lot of them just can't. So they get bought out. And so that's another area I think that would be useful too. Okay, no, all good points. Um, and I guess I just have one last question for you. And again, I don't expect you to have the, the silver bullet here on this okay. one, but um, for municipal <laughs> elections, we traditionally see a really poor turnout, mm -hmm. voter tur turnout. Um, we know that municipal level is where things really happen and where changes can take place. How will you inspire people to get out and vote? Well, I've been knocking on doors and talking okay. to people. Um, I know that uh, at, at a certain point, the city provides declared candidates with a list of voters. Mm -hmm. And that's who you want to target because they're most likely to vote. Um, but I've been enjoying just knocking on every door. Right. And I say, are you planning on voting? And, and some people say, I've never voted. it. And I say, well, j you can go to the city website and register, you know, and explain a little bit about it. I, I think I need more of more of the details of how to do it, but it, it looks pretty easy from the web page I've looked at. So why do you think people aren't voting? Um, I think that you bring up another good point. The issues are sometimes more than people want to take the time to look at. And I think we mm -hmm. good journalism like your show, um, Tri-City News puts out some good articles, I, and uh, social media is a good good promise too. I think we need to get people understanding what the issues are and how they can, and, and government shouldn't be about, it's, it's always so complicated, oh, that won't work because of this. I think, right. I think it also has to be about what do people want and let's just find, find a way to do it. The, the council can filter that into something practical and the staff, they're, right. they're professionals, they're highly paid professionals who can make it happen. Well, we'll end on a positive note then. Um, so thank you so much, Ben, for coming in and joining us this afternoon. Um, it was great to hear some of your priorities and, and things that you would like to see happen. And we'll wish you all the best in, in your campaign for Coquitlam City Councillor. So thank you for joining us this afternoon on We've Got Issues. Again, we um, would like to express our gratitude to Tri-Cities Community Television for helping us to make these interviews possible. Thank you.